Oh boy. Just two. Nothing too crazy. Well, turn her is watching. Yeah. Like I said, I've always wanted to do a podcast with you. Ooh, now you've given me a golden opportunity. <laughs> I'm going to actually trust you, Bruce. Yeah. I'll ask you questions about what you're talking about. I'm going to cruise through this. You doing the first third tonight? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, bourbon. Bourbon. Yeah, bourbon made. Mm-hmm. It's a mystery. Huh? I'm going to tell him tonight. <laughs> what's our watch count at right now? Mm-hmm. What's, what's our watch count at right now? Four. Four? Mm-hmm. Oh. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Are you doing the uh, the introduction and stuff too? As uh, you're just gonna go right into. Got it. Preaching the priest is literally shaking the earth. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created. You shall renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit instructed the hearts of the faithful, grant that by the same Spirit we may truly wise and never lose in his consolation. Through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Uh, let's see, my, my own guardian angel, help me. 
uh, the guardian angels of Bishop Sheen and Bishop Barron. Um, also, if you could teach my guardian angel how to help me do this, because I'm really not used to being in front of a camera. So, uh, angel of God, my guardian dear, to whom his love commits me here. Ever this night be at my side to light and guard, to rule and guide. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Good evening, everyone. Good so, uh, I want to thank our Father Simon and uh, Seminarian John McFadden on Allison Schwiegel for being here. It's always, I must admit, I find it easier to uh, at least have something of an audience that I can see. Um, you know, I have to tell you, when I teach these classes, one of the big things that I miss that uh, I, I wish were happening tonight is usually uh, after class, a couple people stop me with some, some pretty deep questions. And I, those are some of my favorite moments in teaching, not necessarily the up here and speaking in front of everybody. So uh, I just, you, you know who you are, my, my usual class students, uh, I, I miss you. So. so yeah, so tonight we begin a three-part series on one of my favorite church documents, uh, Verbum Domini. It was a, a letter after a synod of bishops. So a group of bishops got together in Rome uh, at Pope Benedict's request, and the Holy Father was asking them, how can we better uh, promote the Bible uh, among us Catholics and, and indeed all people? And so he got a bunch of answers from a bunch of different bishops from a bunch of different places, and he, he read all those answers and then kind of put them all together in one, uh, John, what is it, about 100 pages? Do you think maybe 50? Uh, 60. About 60 pages. 60. So I'm going to be honest, the second and the third, so it's a three-part letter, and uh, the second and third parts of the letter are my favorites, uh, as they're actually more down-to-earth and practical. Uh, the first chapter that we're going to cover tonight is a bit more theoretical, uh, but it's not less beautiful than the other two. So I just want to thank you for bearing with me. And uh, if if you don't get a headache from tonight, I will not have done my job. <laughs> right? Some of this this stuff is pretty heady. Okay, so I want to start with a little bit of personal experience. And remember, when we speak of word or words, small w, we... That's usually what we mean when we talk about the scriptures themselves, the actual book. And when we speak of the word with a capital W, we mean God the Son, the second person of the Trinity. Uh, funny story about that, actually. I, when I was in the seminary, um, you know, we all have our gifts, and I feel like one of mine was, is an ability with languages. And so, uh, you know, Hebrew, uh, I, I wouldn't say it came easy, but it, it came easier than it did for many of my classmates, uh, and likewise Greek and you know the, the other ancient languages. And so I, when I was in seminary, I wrote Bishop Doran at the time. May he rest in peace. He was the bishop at the time. And I asked him, I said, you know, I'm really enjoying my scripture classes. Please pray for me as I learn these languages so that I may better understand the word of God. And I, I wrote it with a small w. And Bishop Doran... Uh, is, as we know, very, very clever. And so he wrote back to me, and he said, I will pray for you that you may get to know the word of God better. Mm -hmm. Right? So uh, it was more important to him, of course, that I would get to know God the Son better than that I, I better understand the words that happen to be in a book. Right? Okay, so this is... This second part, why don't we just check that off? Yes, I know people make fun of me because I make checks backwards, but I'm left-handed, so fellow left-handers out there, you unite. So, God bless you, thank you. for. I, the other reason I, I wanted John here was because I needed a laugh track, so bless you, John. Okay, so this is the hardest, this I think is the hardest part. God who speaks, right? Uh, I learned this from our Jewish friends. Uh, you never erase the name of God, right? So if you, have to, if you have occasion to write the name of God on a board, you hyphenate and don't write the whole name. So 
Uh, thank you, all my, my Jewish friends. Yeah, so, so who is this God who is speaking to us? What is he saying? Why does he want to speak to us? Right? In one sense, right? remember as Father Grismer in our mission said, God does not need us, but he wants us. So in one sense, we could say that God literally made us so that he could speak to us. The three Abrahamic religions, right, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, as far as I know, are the only religions in which the God who is worshipped actually seeks creatures. Right? He's actually looking for us. Right? Other religions, you know, we think of, of Zeus and Jupiter and all of those other, you know, what we would call the, the pagan religions. They the, the God just sort of sits on a mountain um, and doesn't care whether we come to him or not. And our God is not like that. He is recklessly, ruthlessly seeking us out. Right? Remember the prodigal son that ran when he saw the son coming home. Okay, so we got to think a little bit about speaking. And of course, we know that our speaking and God's speaking are infinitely uh, different. And yet there is a, a small thread of link. So let's, let's think about speaking. I was, I think in college, I was not in seminary yet, and I attended Christmas Midnight Mass with one of the auxiliaries in Chicago, uh, Bishop Perry. And Bishop Perry, so it was Midnight Mass, and Bishop Perry did, uh, to be frank, what I was always told in homiletics class not to do. He mounted the pulpit, and he picked up his notes, and his nose was very close, like you could tell he was just reading his notes, word for word for word all through the four or five page homily. And about a page in, right, when I finally silenced that voice of why is he reading his homily, it hit me why he was reading his homily. He didn't just prep a homily like the rest of us do. He crafted it. He had written it and rewritten it and edited and edited and to the point where he knew that every single word was carefully chosen. And so he didn't want to miss any of those words. And so that was why he was so vehemently reading every word to us. I'm reminded, I think it was, it was one of our English friends. I, this is, you can laugh at me, go ahead from home. I, I always get quotes from our English friends mixed up. I, I can't tell whether this quote was from Winston Churchill or from G.K. Chesterton, because sometimes their quotes sound very similar. But one of them said, began a, a long letter with the phrase, sorry for the long note, I did not have time to write a short one, right? So sometimes the better we know something, the more simply we're able to express it, right? Uh, a recent author wrote that perfection is not achieved when there is nothing left to add. Rather, it is achieved when there is nothing left to remove. That said, Let's take another look back at this word, okay? <clears throat> God the Son is the word of the Father. Again, not an easy concept, but a beautiful one. You know how a word or a concept is begins as a part of you, 
and yet it also seems distinct from you, right? You have an idea in your head and it, you, it, it obviously came from you, didn't come from somebody else, and yet it's not the same as you, right? There's, there's more to it than that, right? So we theologians wiser and holier than I have said that when St. John the Evangelist called our Lord the Word, the Logos, that that was perhaps why he said that. So remember, let's take a look at our, our Trinity, right? Um, it is the greatest mystery of our faith, right? I love it. Um, it's, it can be confusing. In one way, it's very simple. Remember St. Augustine, he was trying to make sense of the Trinity and uh, he was walking on the beach and a little girl was, uh, had a shell and she was trying to pour water into a little hole in the sand on the beach. And St. Augustine said, what are you doing? And she said, I'm trying to fill, I'm trying to take all of this water, so the water from the ocean, all of it, and, and fill it into this little hole. And St. Augustine said, well, you can't do that, it's impossible. Yes, it is. But here's a little bit we can figure out about the Trinity. So, God is love. So, we have a Father. And of course, if God is love, there ought to be something or someone to love. So, we have the Beloved. So, the Father loves the Son. And the Son loves the Father. And this love is so amazing and so powerful that the Holy Spirit proceeds, as we say in the Creed, he proceeds from the Father and the Son. Right? And yet, the Spirit has no other goal than to be ever more fully immersed in the love of the Father and the Son. I'm told that when Einstein used to give his lectures, he would write math formulas on the board. And every now and then, he would just have to step back and look, and he would get chills. And then he would go, isn't it beautiful? Right, so the Son is the word of the Father. Right, we, we look at, there's, there's two analogies. Again, analogies always pale, right? But we can think of, the, of any father delighting in any son. Right? Now, of course, if we take the love that all earthly fathers have had, have, and will have for their sons, and we combine all of them, that's still a drop in the ocean compared to the delight that God the Father has in God the Son. Right? Another example, it's a bit more um, heady, is when, when an author... You, you think of like, like a Margaret Mitchell writing Gone with the Wind or a Leo Tolstoy writing War and Peace, like these gigantic works. And how many years, um, and probably tears, right? You know, how many times were they tempted to give up? Uh, you know, all, all of that just, again, I, the, the, most, the most I've ever written was a 100-page thesis. So I, I don't know what it's like to write a novel, but I can imagine because that 100-page thesis was pretty rough. <laughs> so they... And that you, you come to that point where you're done editing and it's ready for publication. And so those were kind of the two analogies that theologians have come up with to better understand 
the father-son relationship that of the, the author delighting in his work. Right, again, the word. Um, double check my notes. Okay, so how, so we, we've looked at the speaking God. Now we can take a look at the at the way that he speaks. Uh, let's see, why don't we just don't need to erase any of this. Um, we'll just, I'll put it here. So there's basically three ways that God speaks. The natural law, the old law, and the new law. So, the easiest way to describe this, at least for me, is let's take an example. And I think one of the easiest examples for me is a tree. Right? You've seen them, right? Perhaps you've cut one down, right? Um, someone had to cut a tree down to, to make this, right? So, so, on the natural level, we've all seen trees. Now, we could get a biologist in here, and the biologist could talk about a tree and, you know, how the roots work and how the leaves work and how they, you know, they, they process and how they live and then how they multiply and how they reproduce and, right, all that, that beautiful science stuff, right? We could talk to a chemist about, well, how much carbon is in that wood, Right? We could, if we really wanted to, we could, we could take a chunk of this wood and see how much carbon is in that wood and maybe find out how old it is. Right? Um, even philosophy and, and poetry, right, they love to point out how the tree requires nurturing. Right? It needs water, but it also gives fruit. Right? So it feeds us. Um, and and of course, we know that the leaves die annually, most of them, right? You know, not the coniferous, the, the deciduous, right? my, my science is going. So, but then they come back to life, right? So we, we notice that. So, so all of that, right? And, and remember, you know, God created nature. So he, he speaks to us through it, right? So, you know, I, when, when I said we're going to talk about scripture, obviously scripture is the eminent way that he speaks through us, but it is not the only way. Okay, so the Old Law, right, also called the Old Testament, um, if you're speaking to our Jewish brothers and sisters, uh, please, for your sake and theirs, do not call it the Old Testament. Call it the Hebrew Scriptures. Right? So the Old Law... Right? Remember, there were two trees in the Garden of Eden. There was the tree of life that they would eat and live forever. And then there was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that they were forbidden from eating. Right? So there's, there's that element. Of course, our first parents ate the forbidden fruit. And, uh, you know, there's that legend that, uh, that Adam took a seed from the core of the forbidden fruit and gave it to his son, Seth. And Seth planted a tree uh, that was later chopped down to make our Lord's cross. Right? Again, beautiful legend. You don't have to believe it as a Catholic. Um, I, I do because it's beautiful and I want to. Um, which I think is as good a reason as any. Um, right? So the, so, we, so the Old Testament, we have, we have trees. Um, we also, another, another image of the tree is the fig tree. And, uh, you know, in the first psalm, we hear about the tree planted near running waters, right? You know, I, I remember my grandfather had a tree in front of his home, and with my grandmother, of course. And I, Grandpa used to always say to me, he would say, you know, when, when there's no rain... He goes, and the grass goes brown, it's fine, because the grass is turning brown so it can survive. He goes, 
the tree needs a lot more water than that grass. So you got to make sure that that tree is watered, right? I remember he, he watered and watered and watered it and it was, it was great and beautiful. Um, and then uh, I think after about 20 years, the poor, poor guy felt so bad for him. The tree got struck by lightning and it, uh, you know, was no more anyway. So, but so the, back to the fig tree. So the, so the fig tree, right? They always pictured that the man who studies woman who studies sacred scripture, the Torah is like a tree planted near running waters, right? If the tree's near the river, it doesn't need to, us worrying about to plant it or not, or to, to water it or not. Right. And of course the fig tree also in the Holy land, every family home had a fig tree and it was always, it provided nice shade. And so when the children would come home from studying Torah, they would do their homework under the fig tree. And so the fig tree became a symbol. So if you said to, to a young man, you know, if you said to your son, you know, stay under that fig tree, right? That meant, you know, keep, keep studying your, your scripture, right? Um, incidentally, of course, also the fig tree uh, bore fruit every day. Like there'd be like one or two figs that you could eat. And so the children, of course, would come home hungry and they could have a snack. That was the other, the other reason. Okay, so now we go from the old to the new, right? And of course, the noblest tree of all is our Lord's own cross. Right, so we, the, and of course, the cross did not come to destroy these other two, right? So my hope and prayer would be that every time you see a tree, you would think of our Lord's cross. Um, and, and likewise, if we think of the tree of life, right, the, you have forbidden, you, you can, uh, our Lord died so that we could live forever, right? And so his, his cross uh, is that tree of life, right? Um, it was undoing uh, the, the sin of our first parents by eating from the forbidden tree, right? I love on the Feast of the Holy Cross, there's a line where the, the priest prays, you, you placed the wood of, you placed the salvation of the world upon the wood of the cross so that where death arose, life might again spring forth and the evil one who conquered on a tree might likewise on a tree be conquered. Okay. Um, I know our seminarian uh, was kidding me that uh, he was saying, he was, Father, get ready, I'm going to try to stump you. So uh, any, any questions, John? You doing okay? Two of them. Okay. What you got? Uh, first of all, you wrote on the board that um, when we write the name of God, we mm -hmm. do not... We don't write it full out, we hyphen it, but why, that's for the Jews, but why do we now, how come we're not able to write the name of God and speak the name um, like Adonai? Speaking, well, I would say speaking and writing are different. Okay. Um, and of course there, there are, in, in the Old Testament, uh, Almighty God has many different names. Mm -hmm. So Adonai was a respectful one. Um, there is another one, the, the Tetragrammaton, mm -hmm. that uh, recently, uh, so Pope Benedict, who wrote this letter, he met with our Jewish brothers and sisters when he was reigning. And so there, there were a number of, um, I'll just, it's, it's spelled Y-A-H-W-E-H. -E um, I, I won't say it. Because, so, uh, so Pope Benedict met with a number of uh, major world leaders of the Jewish community. And uh, one of the things he, he asked for them was, he said, is there anything that the Catholic community can do for you? And he said, please, they said, please tell them to stop saying that word. It's too sacred, right? So uh, His Holiness issued a letter uh, even asking, so like even in various, uh, you know, more contemporary hymns, sometimes we would use that word. And so he asked out of respect for our, our older brothers and sisters that we would not. Um, is that kind of? But you don't write G-O-D on the board, you write a dash. Why would, why come you can't write an O there? Because then I would have to erase the name of God. Got it. It's a devotional thing. I mean, there's no. That makes sense. Right. Second question. Yeah. Can you speak on the co-eternality of the Father and the Son at the same moment? I would love to. 
specifically the Fulton Sheen example. Right. The of course. <laughs> Our seminarian is, God bless him, right? There's a classic, there's a classic analogy. So remember, the, the son comes from the father, and yet we can never say that there was a time when God the father existed and God the son did not, right? And some, some people love to ask, well, why, why is that? And the... The analogy that we've come up with is that imagine a, a father uh, whose wife just gave birth to the firstborn child, who is a son. Now, obviously, the father existed as a man before the son, and yet the father was not a father until the father had a son. Right. Did I explain that correctly? Yes. Then, Would you like a you. third question, a third and final? Sure. Okay. Can you explain the distinction between how we talk about Jesus, like the Word of God, in a particular point in time when he became incarnate, mm -hmm. yet the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, whom we also say is Jesus, mm -hmm. never having a beginning? Or no? Yes. So this example, it's, it's interesting you bring that up. I, I remember teaching a class uh, at my former parish at St. Rita's, and I, I was trying to help them better understand the relationships between the persons of the Trinity. And I mentioned the, father, the son coming from the Father, and this lady immediately raised her hand and said, was that what happened at Bethlehem? No. Right, because, so what is portrayed, albeit obviously very simply and, and does not do justice, right? Figure, I mean, the reality of what we see here is what will amaze and captivate us for an entire eternity, right? So um, it's, it, it is more than this. However, it, this, this portrays what happens in eternity. Um, so the, it's good you bring this up, John, actually. I'm, I'm reading a, a more devotional work by uh, Blessed Columba Marmion. And he, I'm in a, a chapter of his on, uh, on God the Son. And the phrase that the chapter is entitled is, In Sinu Patris, in... Uh, in the, the chest, as it were, of the Father, meaning almost like, like, like embrace, right? And, of course, so whether it was before God became man in the womb of our Blessed Lady, uh, whether it was when he was born, walked this earth, was crucified, died, was buried, rose from the dead, uh, and ascended into heaven, uh, any of those stages, through all of them, he was in the embrace of the Father. Right. Is that basically what you're asking? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay. Um, I don't know. Allison, are we, are we getting questions from people back home or anything? Um, no questions, just comments. Okay. Like, thank you. this is the coolest thing I've ever seen on a computer. Oh, bless you. Thank you. <laughs> That's from Shelly. Shelly. Thank you, Shelly. You go, Shelly. <laughs> so, our... Our response, right? Okay, so we've got, so God, God is speaking to us. These are three of the ways that he's speaking to us. Um, oh, I forgot to give you homework. Now, I won't test you on this, but I've gotten a number of emails from people saying they're, they're stuck at home and bored. So if, if you're looking for something to do, here's what you can do. So I did the whole natural old new law thing with a tree. I would argue you could also do the same thing with the following. Water, oil, bread, wine, rock, man, woman, light, and darkness. So I'm sure there are others, but those, those come to mind as, so what is God doing through those? 
on these different levels. Okay. I do have a question now. Mm -hmm. uh, this is Andrea, and she says, I have a friend who struggles with the concept of the Trinity. He thinks it's a human construct for us to understand. But if God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are one and the same, why do we need the Trinity? Why do we need the Trinity? Right. I would... So, remember, the, so Trinity, there's the word Trinity, and then there's the truth that the Trinity explains, <laughs> or, or names, I'll say. Um, now, we, we need God, right? So, the, in that sense, we do need the Trinity, right? Now, if... Uh, it depends on your friend, so I don't know your friend's religious background, right? So if your friend uh, is a fellow Christian, right, there is biblical evidence, and I would, I would direct you to Catholic Answers, uh, catholic.com, I believe that address is, catholic.com. And uh, there, is, there are biblical passages that show forth, of course, the divinity of God the Father, but then likewise the divinity of God the Son and the divinity of God the Holy Spirit. So, uh, sacred scripture indicates that God the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. Um, so, we as Catholics always profess the divinity of all three of them, three persons, right? Now, the term, the term Trinity uh, is correct, not in sacred scripture explicitly, um, and yet there are many concepts in sacred scripture that are not explicitly named. Um, and just because they're not named doesn't mean they, they're not scriptural, right? Um, Father Simons is... I think, yeah, just to expand on what Father said, mm -hmm. it's not really, Trinity is not a human, it's not really a human construct, it's just a human acknowledgement of, of what God mm -hmm. has already done. So, uh, so God is, God revealed himself to us as a Trinity, mm -hmm. so... So we just acknowledge that much. God revealed himself as a, commun a, a communion of persons. Mm -hmm. So we just, we are acknowledging that. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not our uh, creation. Mm -hmm. I, would, I, I sure. would say, just right. like you said, you know, God doesn't need us, but, uh, but he wants us, he desires us, and mm -hmm. that's how he communicates himself to us in, in the commun in communion of persons. Mm -hmm. Uh, as, so basically, mm -hmm. it's the Trinity because because God says it's the Trinity. He, yeah, he, if if I tell you my name is Father Evans, then, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, like if we go to the if we go to Genesis one, like let us make man in our image, like the word that's used there is a plural. And then we go to Matthew twenty eight, it says Jesus like baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So this isn't. It's not something that people created. It's something that divine revelation gives to us uh, to mm -hmm. tell us who God is. Right. I would the the other. So remember, we we have two two things we have to avoid. Um, thank you, thank you all, all three of you. Um, is there's we we don't want to divide the Trinity, but we also don't want to. The term is confounding the persons. Right, um, I knew a man who tried to tell me that uh, the three persons are really three experiences of God. Right, that's a heresy called modalism. Right, uh, the Greek word for mask is modos, and so uh, it was. All, so somebody a couple centuries ago said, "Well, it's it's almost like like the one the one person in God." you know, put, put the father mask on at one time, and then he put the son mask on at another time, um, and then the Holy Spirit at another time. Um, the problem with this, of course, is uh, at our Lord's baptism, right? Um, I, I cannot, I, I did theater in high school, so acting, right? And there was one, one play, I was in, uh, we're not in the theater, so I can say it, I was in Macbeth, and I played Duncan, and then I played, um, 
I forget what somebody a, a murderer. I can't remember what the name of the murderer was, but I, I played played two people. Now, of course, they were never on the stage at the same time because I can't be two people at once, right? Um, although sometimes when the rectory phone rings off the hook, I wish I could. <laughs> Bad joke, sorry. Anyway. So, but so so the holy so it it is not one person acting as father and then acting as son and acting as Holy Spirit. They are three distinct persons that are the one God. So um, I almost want to pull a Father Kotnik, right? He would, whenever there was a question, he would say, if you need anything, just call Father Simon, <laughs> right? Uh, Father Simon is our RCIA guy, so uh, he's, he's more used to getting questions like this than I am. So uh, you feel, feel free to call him. Of course, I'll answer the phone too, <laughs> but... Um, no, Father, don't give me that dirty look. Um, okay, so our response, right? So, so God's speaking to us, and we, we come back. And so uh, I'm basically just going to kind of go through the, the main paragraphs of this, uh, of our response, and uh, we'll, we'll get, I want to conclude in a timely manner. Right, so the first one is he, we are called to the covenant with God, right? And people often wonder, you know, what, what is this covenant language? Maybe this is hyper simplistic, and I think, I'm sure a theologian or two would argue with me on this, but I, here's, for me, this is the easiest way to, to do it. And, and now John's giving me a dirty look. I don't, this is, <laughs> gotta love it. So, so the, a covenant... Right. Remember, in in legal speak, right, there are at least two different kinds of contract. Right. Most, because we're human beings, most contracts are what we would call bilateral. Right. Uh, you give me X amount of money. I give you my house. Right. And we sign a contract, and that's the closing of the selling of a house, right? Um, a covenant is not a bilateral contract. It is actually two unilateral contracts, right? So a unilateral contract is basically one-sided, right? Um, so you take the two people, the guy selling and the guy buying, and then it becomes the guy... Uh, the guy selling simply says, I'm going to give you my house no matter what. That's that. Right? And so Almighty God has done that. Right? He, he loves us, and there is absolutely nothing we can do um, to make him stop loving us. Right? Now, I would argue... Uh, the best way to live life is to return the unilateral contract with another unilateral contract, right? There's that, that hymn that says, you know, you have given yourself to me, now I give myself to thee, right? Um, love is repaid with love alone, right? Give, give your life to Jesus. Jesus, I'm yours, right? So God hears us, and he also responds to our questions. Right, I the one thing that I, I think some of us Catholics fall into. So our founding fathers followed a religion that was called Deism, and Deism says the 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 image they always give it is that God was a clockmaker. Right. So what does a clockmaker do? He puts everything together, winds up the clock, and then walks away, and that's that. Right. So, I've, I've run into many Catholics where they, they honestly don't think that God speaks to them. And that is not true. You have a God who loves you, and a God who wants to speak to you more than you want to listen to him. Right? Um, I know some, sometimes... You know, if, if you want to kind of start working on getting used to listening to God, 
Um, I'm going to give you a, I'm going to tell you a secret. Um, it's okay to use your imagination, right? So, you know, the old, uh, you know, the, the, the classic story of, you know, get two chairs together, sit in one and picture Jesus on the other and, you know, ask him a question. And yeah, there are times where it is going to be you're, you imagining what he would say back, right? But who made your imagination? God did, right? Um, so uh, the one thing I will tell you is God always builds up. He never tears down, right? So uh, he's, he loves you. Uh, he's going to challenge you, right? He's going to say, okay, this, this behavior is not good for you. I love you. Please stop doing that, right? But he's never going to condemn, right? So if, if you picture yourself talking to Jesus and suddenly you hear a strange condemning voice, that's not Jesus, right? Pray, pray the prayer to St. Michael, okay? So, so that, God doesn't actually call us idiots? Correct. <laughs> Our guardian angels might like shake our head, their heads oh, okay. every once in a while. Yeah, my, <laughs> mine does a lot. So, um, right, we, um, so, so the reason he speaks, and the, and and the reason we have a Bible at home, is that we are to be in dialogue with God through His words. Right. I was, I was in middle school, and my family were staying in Galena for a small vacation. And we visited the Trappist Monastery uh, over in Iowa. And a monk there gave me a little card, and it was entitled, A Letter from Jesus. And the monk told me, he said, uh, sometimes uh, listening can help speaking back. He said, so, you know, picture Jesus saying this letter to you, um, and then how would you... What, what would you write back to him? What would you say back to him? Right? Um, that was a beautiful letter, um, but we've, we've got a huge letter. Right? We've, we've got sacred scripture. Um, the word of God and faith. Right? Notice, uh, we miss you at Sunday Mass, right? But at Sunday Mass, there's, there's a gospel, then there's a homily, developing what was heard before, and then there's the creed, right? So, so the hearing of the gospel is meant to lead toward a deeper faith, okay? Uh, sin, right, is a refusal to hear the word of God, right? God is talking to you, and he loves you, and he knows that that one action that hurts him hurts him because it hurts you. Um, and the final section of this is a favorite of mine, um, Mary, mother of God's word and mother of faith, right? We know that Mary pondered, um, pondered the word in her heart, and we, we must always imitate her um, in, in that way, um, right? The, the word became flesh in her womb and then left her womb, right? I was in, um, when I was at Catholic U uh, as a college student, Across the street is uh, the Dominican House of Studies, so where, where the future Dominicans uh, are learning. And the official term for Dominicans there are called the Order of Preachers, Friars Preachers. And so that was, so they were founded to preach. And they're in their chapel uh, where the, the young men uh, pray every day. There's a statue of Our Lady, um, and it's, it's one I, I don't, I, I, maybe Our Lady of Guadalupe might fit this bill too, uh, but the statue of Our Lady, she is very beautifully and visibly pregnant. She's like out, the statue of her like out to here. And uh, one of the, the young friars told me, they said that they, they got that image of Our Lady because they themselves were studying God's word so they could get ready to preach it. And so just as the word was getting ready to leave Our Lady's womb, uh, to be to to go public, as it were, uh, they themselves were getting ready to go public too with with 
the same word. Um, uh, some crazy things that this mind finds beautiful. <laughs> and interpretation of the scripture in the life of the church. Uh, the Pope reminds us that the church as a whole is the primary setting for biblical hermeneutics, for interpreting sacred scripture. Um, remember, we want you to read the Bible, right? And we want you to uh, see what the Bible's telling you to do differently, right? There, there are going to be moments where you notice the example of our Lord, our Lady, or St. Paul, or St. Peter, my own patron saint, St. John, um, and they might be calling you to do something different with your life. Please, yes, yes, it, that's a good interpretation, and, and go ahead with that, right? But overall, the church as a whole uh, is where the word is heard, mainly, right? So um, we as a community hear the word together. Uh, the Pope also talks about the literal sense and the spiritual sense. Um, these, these are a, a favorite of mine. Um, there is the, uh, there's the literal, um, and then uh, the uh, allegorical, and the moral, and the anagogical. Okay, so the literal... So this is one of my favorite ways to pray with sacred scripture, I have to tell you. So uh, the literal is not what we think of when we think of literal, okay? So the literal means what the human author of sacred scripture meant to convey to his or her human audience, okay? Um, so when people say, Catholics don't take the Bible literally. We absolutely take the Bible literally. However, we take it as the sacred writer, as we call him, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the sacred writers. The Holy Spirit is the ultimate author, right? Um, we take it literally as Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John would have meant it to be taken, right? So notice, classic example, when our Lord said, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out. No one was talking about, about mutilation, no one was, right? They were using uh, uh, an extreme example to prove a point. Okay, so uh, then the literal, so then the allegory uh, tells us uh, it relates to our faith. Um, and then the moral is what to do. And then the anagogical is where we're going eternally. Okay. So another example, okay, so we had the tree for the natural old and new law. Um, I'm, I'm gonna take the, uh, one of the first verses in Genesis. Uh, God said, Yehi or, let there be light. Okay, so the literal would be, yes, God made light. Plain and simple, right? Okay, the allegorical, usually the allegorical for us Christians would be related somehow to Christ. Now, wait. Didn't Christ say, I am the light of the world? Yes, he did. Right, so that's the allegory. So when, when, when God made the light, God knew that God was going to say, I am the light of the world. Right, God saw the future. Okay, now the same God who said, I am the light of the world, also, what did he say about us? The retreat, you are the light of the world, right? So being the light of the world, of course, means living differently, right? So the moral sense has us living differently because we are called to be light of the world. Like people are supposed to see things more clearly because they look at us, right? Lord, help us be faithful to that. Okay, um, anagogical is where are we going 
right? Ana in Greek, the first three letters, is up, right? So, so heavenward. So, right, what do we talk about? God dwells in unapproachable light, right? So heaven, right, there is no darkness in heaven. So that would be where the phrase, let there be light, is meant to bring us all the way up to heaven. Uh, the Pope also talks about the Bible's intrinsic unity. Um, again, maybe this is uh, hyper simple, but I, I basically think of it this way. The Apostles' Creed is a summary of the entire Bible, and the Bible is a commentary on the Apostles' Creed. Even though, of course, we know that the Apostles' Creed was written later than sacred scripture. Most of sacred scripture, I would say. Although there are, there are passages where St. Paul uh, quotes what we think were, were early versions of the Creed. So I, I can't say totally later than sacred scripture. Um, and then, of course, the, the summary of the Creed, if you need it even smaller, right, sign the cross. Okay. Oh, this is fun. This is my favorite, another favorite part. Pope Benedict talks about the dark passages of the Bible. The oh. dark ones. <laughs> right. Okay, so... Um, people love to say, well, why is the God of the Old Testament so different from the God of the New, right? Like, you know, Jesus is so friendly. You know, I, I, there was, you know, there was that, that sitcom... <laughs> <laughs> there, there was that sitcom called uh, Dharma and Greg, and uh, Dharma was kind of a lowercase s spiritual woman, you know, spiritual as in like you know, plate of crystals type thing. Um, and and Greg was a pretty, you know, straight laced lawyer. Well, there was an episode where Greg was trying to you know do some soul searching, and so he's got this stack of spiritual books and. She, he's, he starts telling her, he goes, yeah, I've got, um, uh, you know, I've got the Quran, I've got the Vedas, I've got the, you know, just saying all these, these different, you know, wisdom books from around the world. And he goes, and, and, he, and he, he, she says, so what, what are you reading now, honey? And he goes, I'm, you know, page one of the Bible. And, and Dharma goes, oh, that's easy. Part one, don't mess with God. Part two, be nice to everyone else. And he goes, Oh, okay, and he passes it aside and goes to the next book. Oh. No, don't do that. Okay, so why, why are there supposedly dark passages, particularly of the Old Testament? Well, this is where, again, I love our Jewish friends, uh, this is where it's easier to be a Christian because we can say, that the Old Testament, the Old Law, is a record of God's people getting to know God better. Getting to know God and his will for us better. And so, of course, the fullness of who God is was revealed to us when God the Son became man in the womb of Our Lady. But uh, prior to that, there was growth. Right, so, so we're going to make mistakes. Right? I also love the fact that the most divine book is also the most human book. Right? So um, it, every human emotion is present in sacred scripture. Right? If you ever, maybe, maybe this doesn't happen to you. It does happen to me. Uh, you ever find yourself angry? Maybe I'm the only one. Uh. Um, but one... One way to let the anger out, pick up your Bible, go to the Psalms. The Psalms are in the middle, so just crack the middle, right? The Psalms are the heart of the Bible, as we call it. And go to Psalm 108 or 109, depending on which Bible version you have. And it's a prayer that King David wrote. There was uh, a man was falsely accusing him. And so King David was praying, was asking God that bad things would happen to that false accuser. Um, and I have to tell you, sometimes when I get really, really irritated with someone, I go to that and I, I open it up and I just start praying it. 
And I don't know, this must say something about me. I'm a little afraid to admit this, but it feels really, really good. Um, and usually it might take a second, maybe even a third reading of that psalm. But, by, but there does come a point where I'm not angry anymore because I let the anger out. Okay? So, uh, yeah, so take a look. Uh, the Pope also has to talk about the the fundamentalist interpretation of sacred scripture, right? Again, the, the church's ruling on fundamentalism is that it is dangerous, right? Because you would literally lose an eye, okay? So um, uh, an example, there was a theologian, I, I can't remember his name and I almost don't want to say it because I, I don't want you checking him out, um, uh, there was a, a, a non-Catholic theologian that used to say, uh, with the Bible, do not interpret, just read and do. Well, again, if Jesus says, tear out your eye, right, dangerous. Um, and then the Holy Father talks about the Bible and ecumenism, right? So uh, we mentioned our, our question had, uh, the, you know, We've all got friends that share our Christian faith, uh, but not the fullness of the Catholic faith, right? And so we do have a common Bible, right? Now, granted, some of the books of the Old Testament uh, our, our non-Catholic friends might not acknowledge, uh, but we do acknowledge the same New Testament, right? So that gives us kind of a common jumping off point in, in talking with them, right? Now, the hard part is, is sadly right now, um, our society has become and is becoming a little less and less Christian, right? So sometimes, uh, sometimes we actually need philosophy more than we need sacred scripture. So just remember your audience. So, you know, who are you talking to? Are you talking to a devout Christian? Well, then the devout Christian is apt to listen to the Bible. If you're talking to an atheist, right, um, you know, that's uh, go, go, go the route of philosophy. Uh, the final one in this section, which is, this, this I'll admit is, is a definite favorite of mine in the entire, the entire letter, is uh, I'm, I, I hope His Holiness will forgive me. Um, I would rename the, the paragraph. He named it the Bible and the Saints. I would actually call it a biblical litany of saints because he goes through um, how the saints loved and lived sacred scripture. And he, he mentions a large number of them. So uh, this is just so beautiful. I'm just going to read it straight through. Um, the former Pope says, it is certainly not by chance that the great currents of spirituality in the church's history originated with an explicit reference to scripture. I'm thinking, for example, of St. Anthony the Abbot, who was moved by hearing Christ's words, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. No less striking, new saint, is the question posed by St. Basil the Great in the Moralia. What is the distinctive mark of faith? Full and unhesitating certainty that the words inspired by God are true. What is the distinctive mark of the faithful? Conforming their lives with the same complete certainty to the meaning of the words of scripture, not daring to remove or add a single thing a favorite of mine, St. Benedict, in his rule refers to scripture as a most perfect norm for human life. St. Francis of Assisi, we learn from Thomas of Solano, upon hearing that the disciples of Christ must possess neither gold nor silver, nor money, nor carry a bag, nor bread, nor a staff for the journey, nor sandals, nor two tunics, exulting in the Holy Spirit, Francis immediately cried out, this is what I want, this is what I ask for, and this I long to do with all my heart. St. Clare of Assisi, shared fully in the experience of St. Francis. She wrote, the form of life of the order of poor sisters is this, to observe the holy gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So too, St. Dominic everywhere showed himself to be a man of the gospel in word as in deed, and wanted his friars likewise to be men of the gospel. The Carmelite St. Teresa of Avila, who in her writings constantly uses biblical images to explain her mystical experiences, says that Jesus himself revealed to her all the evil in the world is derived from not knowing clearly the truths of sacred scripture. 
St. Therese of the Child Jesus discovered that love was her personal vocation by poring over the scriptures, especially chapters 12 and 13 of the first letter to the Corinthians. The same saint describes the attraction of the scriptures. No sooner do I glance at the gospel, but immediately I breathe in the fragrance of the life of Jesus, and I know where to run. His Holiness goes on, Every saint is like a ray of light streaming forth from the word of God. We can think of St. Ignatius of Loyola in his search for truth and in his discernment of spirits. St. John Bosco in his passion for the education of the young. My patron saint, patron saint of priests, St. John Marie Vianney in his awareness of the grandeur of the priesthood as a gift and a task. St. Pius, St. Pio of Pietrocina in his serving as an instrument of divine mercy. St. Jose Maria Escriva in his preaching of the universal call to holiness. Blessed Teresa of Calcutta, the missionary, she was a blessed back then, St. Teresa of Calcutta, the missionary of God's charity toward the poorest of the poor, and then the martyrs of Nazism and communism, represented by St. Teresa Benedicta of the Cross, Edith Stein, a Carmelite nun, and blessed, I think he's now a St. Aloysius Stepanak, the Cardinal Archbishop of Zagreb. Right, Every saint is like a ray of light streaming forth from the Word of God. Right, So I think some people think that the more we study sacred scripture, the more we all become the same. And yet, that is not God's will. Right, God's will is that we would find in his word his own plan for each of our lives and that we would become all the more uniquely ourselves. Right? Praise God. Um, any lingering questions, Allison? Uh, not that I see. Not really? Okay. Well, thank you all so much for tuning in. Um, and since we've talked so much about the Trinity, uh, why don't we close with a glory be. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks. See you tonight. See you tomorrow night.